So, pardon me, I'm gonna have to end up looking at my phone a little bit. I've had a, a small run, a good run of bad luck, I guess you might say today. Seems like if it can go wrong, it will go wrong, and I'm sure everybody's heard that story a million times, but I, I got my 12-year-old computer over there that I've had since college and a little bit before, and I was planning on getting a new one within the next week, and of course, it completely crashes with my presentation on it. And I got Google Slides, which you need internet. Well, we don't have internet here. So I ran into that little obstacle, and then I went up to get something to eat. And I was all excited for this pork tenderloin. There's a couple gentlemen right in front of you. Everybody can look at them right here. Gary here took the last bucket of fries, and I'm still a little bitter about it. I'm kind of a potato junkie, hash browns, french fries, whatever. I like potatoes, and he got the last one. And yeah, I mean, if I wasn't such a nice guy, I'd tell him to kick you out, but I'm feeling pretty generous today. So I'm talking about bank fishing. I own a boat, I own, a I own three kayaks, but I will always fish from the bank for lots of different reasons. Just the tranquility of kicking back, relaxing on a sandbar. Don't build a fire in a boat. I'll never recommend that. Bank is much better for a campfire. You got plenty of space to relax. And lots of times that space is pretty nice. You go out there, go with your buddy. I'm a little bit of a prankster every once in a while. I may have once upon a time took a little bit of dip bait and put it on my buddy's peanut butter and jelly sandwich. <laughs> and I tell you what, that space came in, came in handy because I got to run from him. If I was running from a boat, I bet he would have caught me. So bank fishing, near and dear to my heart and I always do it. Now, who I am, some of you may know me, some of you may not, but you all will here in a sec. My name is Spencer Bauer. I'm a junior high science teacher, and teaching is kind of the love of my life, along with fishing, obviously. Big catfish fanatic, um, diehard Cubs fans. Anybody wants to talk trash about the Cubs after this, I'm the guy to talk to. I'll argue with you all day. Love my Cubs, and I've been a Cubs fan my whole life. Um, my guy. And I don't see any St. Louis hats in here. I wouldn't kick, I'd normally kick you out. Oh, you guys, I'm generous today. I'm not kicking you out today. That's right. I had them lower the volume for you. Oh, thanks. Because you took your fries. Oh, oh, okay. That's smart. So you guys will take my fries, but at least you're smart about it. So, um, diehard Cubs fan, catfish fanatic. I got a YouTube channel. It's called River Certified. That's why I'm wearing the River Certified shirt. If you want some River Certified stickers, I got a couple of them over at the Whisker Seeker booth. And uh, every little bit helps me and I'd really appreciate it. So the big thing for bank fishing, it's a lot like any kind of fishing. You got to be where the fish are at in order to catch the fish. It sounds so simple, but 90% of the fish are in 10% of the water. And if you're looking at rivers, looking at lakes, looking at reservoirs, looking at streams, each different types of type of body of water has a little slight variation and where you need to be fishing, but the concept remains the same. Changes. Anytime you have a change in a uniform portion of a body of water, it's going to concentrate fish. So um, the other things to keep in mind, the specific spots change based on time of year, water temperature, and water level. So first off, we'll start with small streams and rivers. The first place everybody wants to go fish is a dam. And dams are excellent places to go fishing, don't get me wrong. But there's a time, and they'll hold fish year-round. Any, anybody, anytime can scroll down, stroll down to a spillway. There's spillways all over the country, all over the state. And I bet you there's one within an hour near you if you're within an hour of a body of water. And there's fish there right now. But during certain water levels, and it's really easy, early in the year, when you get that pre-spawn movement of fish heading upstream, the higher the water, the more fish run up river. You get high water early in the year, and early in the year varies depending on what location in the country you are. Early in the year in Tennessee might be March or April. Early in the year where I'm from, central Iowa, we're talking middle of May into June, especially if we're talking about flatheads. But high water early in the year sucks those fish up to those spillways, and spillways are awesome. Anybody can access the spillway. You got nice sidewalks in a lot of them. Um, sure, there's some rocks, but you don't have to stand on them rocks to fish in a lot of them. Just stand on those nice sidewalks and catch your fish of a lifetime. But timing's everything. But like I said, real simple. High water, early in the air, head to some spillways. Another one is deep holes in the river. You have a uniform run in the river, and then all of a sudden it drops off. That's going to concentrate fish. 
Uh, but a good rule of thumb in moving water, and I don't care if you're fishing from the bank, a boat, a kayak, you're wading, whatever, the higher the water is, like you got in the Ohio over here right now, where it's swollen bigger than life, the higher the water, the shallower you fish. Because that high water, now blue cats are a little bit of an exception, but channel cats and flatheads, where I spend most of my time fishing, if that water's roaring, they're right on the bank. And it doesn't matter if it's at night, it doesn't matter if it's in the middle of the day, they're right at your fingertips. There's a reason diddy pulls work, guys. They run those banks, especially at night, but when it's up, they're in there during the day. Now when the water drops, that's where those holes really shine. And after they spawn, and catfish settle into their summertime routine, they move deep into those holes. So the lower the water, the slower moving the water is, typically, the deeper I fish. Now blue cats throw that out the door. They love that fast stuff and they'll be in that deep fast stuff all the time. Another good one is edges. So you got a, a bank where it drops down a foot of water right at your feet, high water, there could be fish there. But when you get a spot right at your feet that drops down to 10, 20, 30, 40 feet of water depending on where you're at and what body of water you're fishing, now you're getting somewhere. And those, if you have access to a, a place that drops like that, then you can be on some fish nearly any time. And lastly is pinch points. Now this plays out more in lakes and reservoirs that I'll talk about here in a minute, but anytime you have a wide stretch of river, and especially on a big river, like you're talking the Tennessee, flowing reservoir type places, um, Lake of the Ozarks, on the upper stretches where you have kind of a flowing reservoir, you have a wide section of the reservoir where it chokes down and you have steep contours and it funnels and increases the current. In that fast current you'll find your blue cats on the edges, on those current seams where those sharp contours start to widen out a little bit. That's where you find your channel cats and your flatheads. It's all about finding a way to get to those places, which we'll talk about a little more here in a sec. Now with reservoirs, same general concept, you're looking for edges. And electronics are your friend. Navionics is your friend on lakes and reservoirs, whether you're in a boat or you're from shore. But you have a place where you have a change. You have a long flat that extends out from the creek channel. Sure, there can be fish scattered out on there, but if you're fishing from the bank, you're not able to troll, you're not able to drift very well. You got to cover water with your lines and hope fish move through. Well, they will, and you'll catch some fish, but if you set up along those transitions, you have this long, expansive flat, you have the shoreline, and then that creek channel runs up, and the shoreline and the creek channel meet, and you have that transition from deep to, to shallow water, now you're really getting somewhere. You have a place that concentrates fish that you access from the bank, and now you're on them, and that's a whole lot of fun. Another one, kind of spin off of that, is channel swings. So if you have a straight channel that runs into the bank, that's cool, there'll be fish there. But if you have a channel that runs into the bank and then curves away, you have a deep pocket, and back before it was a reservoir, it was a river. And those channel swings are what concentrates timber cover, and that's where you're gonna find your highest level of structure, concentrating all species of catfish, concentrating all your bait, and if you get one close to the bank, that can be a money spot, and a spot that's not gonna have a lot of pressure to it, especially compared to a spillway. So that is an excellent place to fish from the bank as well. Another one that a lot of people don't think of, and the time it shines is coming up. It's where tributaries dump in the lakes and reservoirs. Because when you get those warm spring rains, and by the sounds of it, you're getting plenty of warm spring rain down here, it brings warmer water into it. And that warmer water pulls up those channel cats and flatheads into those areas, and early in the year, especially in Iowa and in the upper Midwest after the, the snow thaws, those fish, you can have some of the biggest fish in the whole, whole lake or reservoir in a foot or two of water. You hook them, they don't even have anywhere to go. They jump like smallmouth. It's, it's pretty awesome. So that can be a great one. And then once again, those pinch points, places where you have wide expansive flats that choke down. Bridges are an excellent place in rivers or in reservoirs and lakes because you have, that's this place where fish have to move through and they're moving through all the time as they travel from one section of the lake to the other and all those fish that would have been spread out come down and are funneled through that one area underneath the causeway or bridge. Now I don't recommend bridge fishing from a river and here's why, especially a small stream. Because pressure 
plays a big role in small bodies of water. 90% of the fish are in 10% of the water. And under bridges, if nobody fished them, they'd be an excellent place. Usually they're choked down in a river. Usually they have some rock, some structure, increased current that scours out the bottom and creates a hole. But unless you're the first guy there, or the first guy after a big rain, those fish have already seen plenty of presentations, or they've already ended up on someone's stringer and went home. So one thing, that's what we'll get to right now, how do you get there? Well, you, I'm a big advocate of getting away from the crowd. Like I said, dams are very accessible, excellent places to fish. When high water brings those fish in droves, so somebody catches them, if somebody takes them home, or somebody catches them, releases them, and they're not as likely to eat at that exact moment, there's more fish piling in all the time. But that's not the case in a lot of those holes on small streams, or even big re rivers and reservoirs. Pressure can be a little bit of an issue. So getting away from the crowd's important, and getting away from the crowd goes against a lot of the ways some of us bank fish. So I, I got a boat, I got three kayaks, whatever, I'm always going to bank fish, but I use those to help me bank fish more effectively. So the first one, walking. How are you going to get there? Well, if you're walking, you're on your feet. And if you're on your feet and you got to walk very far, you want to have comfortable feet and dry feet. So if I'm walking the bank, I always got a pair of rubber boots on. Now, um, you can use whatever pair of rubber boots you want as long as they keep the water out. That's the most important thing. But having a comfortable pair of rubber boots I use the same ones I turkey hunt with, and they're comfortable, and I'll walk in them all day, and it's no big deal. But if you got an uncomfortable pair of shoes, that's going to reduce how far you want to walk, which reduces the amount of fish you put your bait in front of, which reduces the amount of fish you're going to catch. So the most important thing, obviously, when you're bank fishing is a good pair of shoes that are going to keep your feet dry. Um, the other one is weight and how much crap you're bringing along, but we'll get to that here in a sec. One thing I do a lot of and if, to get to unpressured, or, yeah, unpressured water is do some wading. Now, that might involve waders, like when the water's in the 40s and 50s like it is right now, but once you get warmer temperatures, wait, skin wading ain't no big deal. I'll go up there, I'll wear a pair of shorts, I'll wear my, my sandals, not flip-flops, I'm talking like the dad sandals with the straps, you know what I'm talking about? and go wading in those, and if it's hot out, honestly, it's nice to cool down a little bit. Lastly, not lastly, but close, kayaking's a big one. You, a lot of people are getting wrapped up into kayak fishing. I love kayak fishing. I love using my kayak to fish out of. If you got one with a comfortable seat, ain't no big deal. You're fishing it all day. But what I like to do is fish in my kayak all day, then when it starts getting dark, I want to set up and prime real estate for a big flathead to roll through, and then I set up on the bank just so I can have some more room to pick all my buddies. So I'll use my kayak to get to those prime bank locations, whether it's on a river or a lake or whatever. And if you want to bring a bunch of stuff with you for camping or whatever, it makes it so much easier to load all your stuff in your kayak and paddle nice and leisurely, sipping on whatever your favorite beverage is on your way across the lake or way down the river. And that's my kind of paradise. So I have the same concept and also apply that to when I use my boat. I'll fish out of my boat during the day, spot hop, trying to target daytime flatheads throughout the entire day. And then once it starts getting a little dark in the evening, I set up camp uh, out on the bank and uh, use my boat to haul my stuff around. Now tackle considerations. Steve was talking about how I have a little bit of a system and little things to keep in mind that a lot of people don't, don't really consider when they're bank fishing. Now one of them is weight. How much stuff are you going to bring along? First thing I'm going to recommend is your fishing rod. Now, there ain't every fishing rod in this building, every fishing rod ever made for catching catfish will catch you catfish, no problem. One thing I like to keep in mind is how much does your fishing rod weigh? If you're hauling three to eight fishing rods that weigh a pound and a half to two pounds a piece and you're holding them in your hands like that, walking a mile carrying those fishing rods just kind of went out the door. Uh, you can sit them on your shoulders if you want, and that helps a little bit, but then they start digging into your tricep or your traps or whatever, and it just, it's uncomfortable. So to have a lighter fishing rod, one that doesn't weigh as much, really in, reduces your fatigue carrying them things the whole time, and, and it, they're just a lot more fun to fish with, in my opinion. Now another one, 
especially blow spillways. You see guys fishing surf rods a lot, blow spillways. In a lot of situations, being able to cast very far is not that big of a deal. Like what I was talking about earlier, when the water shoots up and you got those fish right at your feet, lots of times you just stick your fishing rod out, hit the button, drop it straight down and you're, you're fishing. But there are times where you got to cast to get to the fish, especially those spillway situations or you're fishing a big reservoir like Texoma. They move up on those mud flats in the winter, late fall, early spring, and those fish might be 150 yards out there. Well, if you're on the bank, you ain't gonna catch them unless you can get to them. So you gotta be able to cast a long ways. And that's where a longer fishing rod comes to handy. That's where thinner lines like braided fishing line come in handy. Because the longer the fishing rod, general rule of thumb is the longer you're gonna cast. But if you got a big long fiberglass rod that's whippy, it's not gonna cast as far as a graphite fishing rod because the recovery from the bend is so much faster with graphite, that whip of that fiberglass will reduce how far you can cast. So there's that and then your line diameter. I like braided line fishing from shore because you can cast further if you need to because it's so much thinner. It reduces air resistance. And if you're using 80 pound braid versus 50 pound mono, your, your casting distance will be cut by 20 to 35%-ish with that 50 pound mono. So if you need to get your bait out there, a long graphite fishing rod with braided fishing line is gonna be the way to go. But like I said, you don't always need that, especially in small streams. Another one is uh, line control. So a longer fishing rod from shore, once again, is not always necessary, but I tend to use a nine and a half foot fishing rod when I'm bank fishing because of how the current plays on your line. If you use a shorter fishing rod, so this one's only seven and a half feet, and I'll use these occasionally, but you have more line in the water, which means the current's pulling on your line even more, which affects your presentation. If you're not putting your bait in front of the fish, he ain't gonna eat it, because he don't even know it's there. So with a longer fishing rod, you're able to maintain your bait's position within the current a lot better, because there's less line in the water. And that's a big thing a lot of people don't think about. Don't get me wrong, all that being said, you can take a cane pole and catch catfish from the bank. I've done it, it's a lot of fun. It's like tug of war, hand-to-hand -hand combat. And there's a time and place for that. But as far as effective, effectively catching catfish on a consistent basis, nine to 12 foot fishing rods with braided fishing line are pretty well the ticket when you're fishing from the bank. Now, for tackle organization, streamlining things, making it a lot simpler, simpler, I use the KISS method, and I don't know if any of you ever heard of the KISS method. It's an acronym for keep it simple, stupid. And I try to keep that in the back of my mind all the time. So less is more. Like, you need fishing rods to catch fish. All right, so you got to bring the fishing rods. You need bait to catch fish, so you got to bring the bait. You need tackle to put on the end of them, so you bring tackle. Anything else is extra. Now, I understand the enjoyment of kicking back in a lawn chair around a campfire while you're bank fishing, and it can be done. Um, but I forego the lawn chair most of the time for a cushion. I'll take a stadium cushion and put a carabiner clip on it, and I'll clip it to my tackle bag. That eliminates the chair. I get there, I throw the cushion on the ground, prop my backpack up, sit my butt on that cushion and lean against that backpack. That's my chair, and that chair goes with me everywhere, and it's one less thing I gotta carry. And if you're someone who don't like to carry stuff, or you wanna walk a long ways, which sometimes that's the case when you're bank fishing. That's the best way I found. Less is more. Another one, backpacks. Yeah, you can get by with a tackle bag that goes across your shoulder, but the thing is, once you've been walking a little while and you got all that lead in there, because we're catfishing, we've got to carry a bunch of lead, that's going to dig in your shoulder. I know this from experience, and you just get over it lots of times. Don't get me wrong, but a backpack distributes that load across both shoulders and you get those wide straps, the wider the straps, the more comfortable it's going to be. You can haul more stuff. So, and then whatever else I want to bring is whatever else I can fit in my tackle, in my backpack. I bring one single tackle tray 90% of the time, and that's right over here. I swear it's over here. I did have a really nice picture of it on my slideshow, but I guess we'll have to forego that for the actual thing. So this is about all I bring 90% of the time. It's got hooks, it's got beads, it's got swivels, some bobber stops, and then I got a, 
uh, uh, a bag of sinkers. And then whatever else you need goes in your backpack. So little things like something to eat, something to drink, fits in the backpack, it goes. If it don't fit in the backpack, it doesn't go. Um, cameras are a newfound hobby of mine while I'm fishing and that adds a whole new realm to things. But that's a different, totally different seminar. When we're talking about just fishing, that's all the tackle you need. And that's for flatheads, that's for channels, that's for blues. Got 10 aught J's, 8 aught J's. 10 aught circle hooks, 8 aught circle hooks, 6 aught circle hooks, that's all my hooks. Got swivels, snaps, and then she's good. That's it. Less is more, I'm telling you. But backpacks are sweet for hauling gear, long distances, or if you're traveling short distances, just being more comfortable overall. Now, as far as the electronics go, lots of people don't think of electronics with bank fishing. I didn't for a long time. I'm kind of a, I don't know, I, my old man sitting right back there, he'll attest to this. I've been a river rat for as long as I can remember and probably past that. So I love rivers, I love small rivers, and I kind of prided myself on a long time by avoiding the fish finders. Being able to read the river, read the current, and find the fish just with my eyes. And you can get by, once you learn how to read a river, you can get by and catch a lot of fish just doing that. But once I discovered Navionics, that opened up a whole new realm. I've been getting big into ice fishing. It helps a lot with ice fishing. Ice fishing for catfish, ice fishing for whatever. But you go to those bigger bodies of water you've never been before, you can find those ledges. You can find those pinch points. You can find those channel swings that concentrate fish, and it's less of a shot of, in the dark, and it's more of a, a calculated assessment of where you need to go. So Navionics is a big one. Now, one I have always used beyond just reading the rivers, Google Earth. Now, one thing you got to keep in mind with Google Earth fishing those small rivers is it does a really good job of hiding those 100 foot tall sheer bluff banks that you got to shimmy up and down. So keeping that in mind, don't be surprised if you run into a surprise out there and always have a couple backup plans. Don't be married to one single spot like I got to get there otherwise you're going to be paying and I, I, I totally understand that one. So Google Earth will tell you where nice swings in the channel are and in small rivers especially it's really helpful because you can see a lot of those brush piles on the satellite image and you can also see a lot of boils in the water which means there's something in there. It's either a big rock or a single lay down tree which single lay down trees are one of the best spots to catch the biggest flat in the river if you didn't already know that one. And that's one I always keep an eye on. Don't tell anybody I said that. It's, it's just for you guys. But if you know how to read water, you're looking at the water for boils or visible structure and swings in the channel or swings in the river itself, that's going to be your deepest water. And even if you don't see anything in those swings, that, they're, they're going to collect structure underneath the water that you can't see with, on the map and you get there and you assess the current and then that's where the fish are at. Another one, Google Maps. And Google Maps doesn't really do that much more than Google Earth, but what it does do is it shows the area of public land. If it's green on Google Maps, you know it's public. And you know you have no issues stepping on that dirt. So that's one thing I use Google Earth for. But the spin off of that, you also have assessors' websites for each state that outline who owns what. You have plat books that outline who owns what. And then you got Department of Natural Resource websites or wildlife, game and fish wildlife websites, whatever, that tell you where all the public land is. Now, spinning off of that, a lot of the bodies of water I fish are mostly private. So I knock on a lot of doors. And one thing that never ceases to amaze me, how few people are willing to go knock on somebody's door and ask for permission. And if you're a nice, polite individual and treat somebody like you would want to be treated, it's amazing how pe many people say, sure, go on ahead. There's one guy, a good story. I won't say his name. He's an older farmer. And I recently moved to this town and everything I'd heard about this guy was negative. Oh, that guy's a jerk. That guy's mean. He ain't going to let you do anything. And I thought to myself, oh, let him tell me no. <laughs> that ain't no big deal. Went and knocked on his door. Who are you? Spencer Bauer. Nice to meet you. And he introduced himself, and we got to shoot in the breeze. I ended up staying there for an hour and a half listening to this guy tell me some fishing stories that blew my mind. He's been everywhere. Been in the Northwest fishing for salmon catching tarpon in the keys. He'd been all over the place and I got a kick out of listening to those stories. It was awesome. And I go back and I visit him. He said, don't even call if you want to go down and fish there anymore. 
But I go back just to hear him talk because he's got some awesome stories. He even mowed me paths down to the river. I can drive right to the, right to the river bank just because I was a nice, polite individual and asked. So if there's a place you want to fish, figure out who owns it. Use a plat book or the assessor's page. Look them up in the phone book. Figure out where they live. Go knock on their door and ask politely. And some people will tell you no. Don't get me wrong. But it's amazing how many people tell you yes if you're nice and polite about it. If a gate's open, leave it open. If the gate's closed and you go through it, close it when you get through it and don't leave any traces. And if you see trash from somebody else, you pick it up and that's your spot as long as that guy owns it. About guarantee you that. So another thing beyond legalities that you have to consider for bank, bank fishing or any fishing really is comfort because you're not going to fish there very long if you're uncomfortable. It's that simple. So one thing, I'll fish in the heat, I'll fish in the cold, fish in the rain, fish in snow. I don't care, and I'm sure a lot of you are the same way, but I will not fish if there's a bunch of mosquitoes. That will send me home. So I always make sure I got plenty of bug spray and those thermocell things. I'm not sponsored by them, but I'd love to be because they're expensive and they freaking work. So I always bring a thermocell with me at least one, if not two, and they don't get rid of all the bugs, but they do a pretty darn good job, as long as it's not windy. If you get a little wind, whatever that vapor is, they let out, it blows away. Um, so, but they're pretty effective most of the time, especially on a warm summer evening when the mosquitoes are terrible and there is no wind. So there's that, and then rain gear. Rain gear and one more layer than you think you need. So 80 degrees in June, it's hot out during the day, you're sweating, whatever, there's no way I'll need a sweatshirt it gets down to 50 degrees at night. 50 degrees with no sunlight, it's pretty cold. So I always bring one more layer than I think I'll need because if you don't have it, you can't put it on. And there's been times where I even then wish I would have brought more. So I always bring one more layer than I think I need and I always bring my rain gear if there's any slight chance of rain on a one day or evening trip. And if it's multiple days, even if it's supposed to be nice the whole time, I always bring my rain gear just in case you get a pop-up shower. Plus, your rain gear, if you're cold, you can put your rain gear on and stay warm. Or if the bugs are really bad and it's not too hot, you can put your rain gear on and that'll keep them off you pretty good too. And one more thing off of bank fishing considerations. And this is really important if you bring someone along like me or someone also like me, like a small child or your significant other, is you gotta bring snacks. You gotta bring something to eat, because if you're hungry, you're probably gonna go home a little earlier than you would have. And of all things considered, no matter what you're fishing for, what you're doing, time on the water equals more fish, obviously, but even more importantly, you see those guys catching monsters? There's some tricks and tips and little things people know, but the number one determining factor is time on the water. If you're not there, you're not gonna catch them. And no matter what body of water you're on, the biggest fish, there's not that many of them. Now, what a big fish is, is different on each body of water. But your biggest fish, there's very few of them, and the best way to target them is to be there. And if you're not there, you're not going to catch them. So, and if you're going to be there, you might as well be comfortable, and you might as well not be hungry. So, bring snacks. Can't, I've been doing a lot more of uh, campfire food this year, this last year. I'm going to do a lot more of it this year. In fact, I'm going to do a, uh, a little three or four day float trip and I'm gonna bring enough food that should last me the whole time but I'm gonna make a focus to catch channel cats or walleyes or whatever along the float and I'm gonna see how many days I can just eat eat fish because I'll tell you what they got that catfish cook off over there but the best catfish I've ever ate in my life was the one that's cooked on a campfire and that's pretty awesome so that's the gist of it that's how I approach bank fishing the um, keep it simple go where the fish are whatever that may entail for your particular body of water and go out and have a bunch of fun. So, any questions from anybody about anything? Yes, sir. When I'm bank fishing, he asked, since access to live bait is fairly limited, what do you use for bait when you're bank fishing? Well, I do use a lot of live bait for bank fishing and I transport it in a small cooler. So a 20 quart cooler or smaller, you can fit, well, even a, a little lunchbox size cooler will fit six, half a dozen or so live baits in it. 
and then you throw your cut bait in your backpack on a little evening trip and you cover the majority of the bases. And that little snack size cooler, even with water in it, is about 10 or 12 pounds. So while it does weigh a little bit, it, it's very manageable. And then you'll have an air, I have an aerator hooked up to it and I drilled a hole in the side to run my air tubing through. Another strategy is to catch bait when you're there. So you could bring a throw net, you can bring night crawlers to catch a carp to, to chop up, or bluegills or sunfish or something like that. So that's how I approach bait bank fishing, but it, it is a unique challenge that you don't run into in a boat or kayak. And if I'm gonna bring a bunch of, if I'm gonna fish for a long period of time, even from the bank, that's when I bring my kayak or my boat to help haul those bigger coolers. Good question. Anybody else? Come on now. Yes, sir. I, I do. Um, well, in Iowa, you can't go over five foot. So, and a five foot's very manageable in a kayak. You, I, having thrown five footers out of a kayak, he asked it, can you throw a throw net out of a kayak? And having thrown five footers, I, I feel comfortable to throw a six footer out of a kayak, but I'm fishing out of a big, big, big stable kayak. This, um, I'm a big fan of new canoes, the, the Frontier 12, and they, they do have them down there at that booth over there. They're, they're 41 inches wide. And I can, I have a video, you can look it up on YouTube, I'm in a new canoe and I do a cartwheel from one end to the other. They're sta and I do, I stand on my hands in one of them. So they're big stable kayaks, you can do a lot in them and throwing a throw net from one's no big deal. But I wouldn't throw an eight or a 10 probably, but five or six manageable. I'd practice in shallow water first though. Any other questions? Saw another hand go up. Yes sir. I heard something about leaders. What's that? High vis versus low vis leaders. I haven't found it made much of a difference. Now, if you're fishing in clear water, I'm not saying it couldn't. And um, fluor fluorocarbon could definitely come into play. But the biggest thing is whatever you're confident in. He asked about high vis versus low visibility leaders for catfishing. And the biggest thing for me is confidence. Whatever you believe in, because there's tons of quality line out there, whether it's high vis or low vis. But if you feel more confident in high vis line versus low vis, or the other way around, low vis versus high vis, go with whatever you believe in, because that kind of factors into time on the water. If you think you're out there wasting your time, you're not going to stay as long. And if you don't stay as long, you're not going to catch as many big fish. So I'm going to say get you a high quality line. Um, Suffix makes good stuff. Whisker Seeker makes good stuff. Um, Catch the Fever makes some good stuff. There's lots of companies out there that make really good line. Pick the one you like, pick the one you believe in, and stick with it because it's all about confidence at that point in time. Yes, sir. Yeah. So, good question. And I get asked that one a lot. By myself. He asked if I have somebody, when I'm kayaking on a, on a river and I want to fish a river stretch, do I have somebody drop me off and leave my vehicle parked or do I park my vehicle and paddle upstream? And the answer to that is, it depends. If, if somebody wants to give me a ride so I can float down to my truck, I'll let them. That, no big problem. But um, I do, I'll paddle up river, kayak fishing quite a bit. The, the kayak I have now isn't great for paddling up river, but it's got a flat transom, so I can put a trolling motor on it. Um, and they also have a pedal drive option, which I'm gonna hopefully get when I save up my pennies. And uh, that'll help for me going up river and I'll be less reliant on other people. Now, it, it's a little bit of workout heading upstream. I'm not gonna lie, I'm not gonna make it sound like it's real easy, but having a trolling motor helps a lot, and, um, or a pedal drive helps a lot, or having a long, narrower kayak is a lot better for covering distance on a reservoir or paddling upstream in a river because they track a lot better. Flint is a great one. It's a smaller, it's narrower, easier to paddle. The new canoe Flint's another option over there and it still has the flat transom so you can still put a trolling motor on the back. Yes sir?
Yes. That's a really good point. So he asked, I do a lot of videos where I'm kayak fishing for flatheads during the day and I drop baits right down in that nasty cover and try to put that bait right in front of their face and I absolutely, I love doing that. And hooking a big fish on a short line when he's right under your boat or kayak or whatever, because you can do it from a kayak, you can do it from a boat. You want to talk about a back break and fight. I mean, flatheads fight hard, don't get me wrong, but when they're straight down below you and can dive to the bottom, They'll break your back. They're, they're a mean fish. And I, that's, they're my favorite. Absolute favorite, no doubt. Just for that reason. But as far as targeting them during the day from the bank, I don't target them during the day from the bank. I'm targeting those fish that were in that structure, and they come out and roam, and that's why you fish those edges. So they're going to be in that thick structure during the day, and then at night, they'll come out and roam the bottom of those drop-offs. And one of my favorite places to fish in a small stream is where you have a really sharp turn. Not a sweeping bend in a river, but a really sharp turn. And then you have a sandbar, and off the back of that sandbar, it drops straight down. And you have three to six feet of water right off that sandbar. And you don't have to cast very far, and there's l less current to drag your bait up against the bank. And that's a great place for those fish to roam at night, and they follow those edges. So that's where I tend to set up from shore when I'm targeting flatheads. Another strategy though, that's not putting baits and brush piles from the bank, if you want to catch flatheads during the day from the bank, hit a spillway in June in Iowa. Down here it'd be like hit a spillway in, in April or May and fish chunks of cut bait on three-way rigs and fish those current seams or reduce current areas. Flatheads are not blue cats. Blue cats love that fast stuff. If you want to target flatheads, you'll catch them in fast stuff occasionally or if they're buried in structure and fast current during the day. But when they're out roaming looking for something to eat, they go to those reduced flow areas. So we have a, a major spillway on the Des Moines River, Red Rock, and off of Red, off, just below the spillway, there's two coves. And those coves are swirling eddy areas. And you can catch catfish 20, flatheads 24 hours a day in May and June when they're roaming around in those coves. Excellent locations. So I don't t target them in that thick wood cover from the bank unless it was a small enough one you could wade to them. I suppose you could do that. Cool. Yes, sir? What type of battery do you use? Is it something compact mm -hmm. to use a trawling motor with? Are there any types of batteries that you've used? I've seen some people try to use like a car jumper, yep. batteries yep. to charge. Yep. So he asked what kind of batteries I use for my kayak. Um, if I'm running a trolling motor, I just use a 24 group deep cycle. And it's heavy, but I have a kayak that's made to carry a lot of stuff. It's got 600 pound weight capacity in it. Putting a 60 pound battery isn't that big of a deal. Um, but as far as running like my fish finder, I use lithium, lithium batteries for that 10 amp hour lithium. There's a bunch of companies that make them. Um, Dakota, I think is one. I use a Nakwa. And it's about that big and weighs like eight ounces. And that's, for your fish that's for my fish finder and also my cameras run off that battery as well. Um, if you're on, so the next question was how do you get your stuff in the water? Well, the best way is a boat ramp. <laughs> then you can back everything right back down. But sometimes you don't have access to boat ramp for kayaks, and that's kind of when things start to suck a little bit. <laughs> so you have steep banks. Getting them down the banks isn't a big deal. But when you get to the next bridge you're taking out at, then you gotta haul everything back up. So I try to keep my kayak system mirror my bank fishing system. And um, if I'm by myself with a trolling motor, I'm probably gonna use a boat ramp. And if I uh, have to carry them up and down the bank, I'm probably not gonna use a trolling motor. But all, all my kayak stuff, all my tackle is organized into my seat and always stays in there. And then anything else I bring, I got rods, I got a bait tank, and I got a bag. And if it doesn't fit in the bag, it doesn't go. That, and that's it. And then I got my rods, my bait tank, and my, my kayak, and that's it. That simplifies things a lot. The bag goes on my shoulder, and I can haul everything up the bank, and it's not that big of a deal. Unless it is, because you have knee-deep mud or whatever, you know. <laughs> cool. Any, any other questions? Good questions. These are fun. Yes, sir. Are you talking about just keeping fish? 
Okay, he, he asked the question, or if you're going to keep a fish, how do you transport it? If I'm going to transport a fish that I'm going to keep, one, it's not going to be real big. Anything under 10 pounds, especially flatheads, flatheads are delicious, don't get me wrong. I, I love eating flatheads. If they're over 10 pounds, I let them go, which alleviates some of the problems right there. If you have a 10 pound or smaller flathead or channel cats that are like two or three pounds, you can bring a cooler for them. But most of the fish I keep, they're during cooler, water, or cooler weather. So I just throw them in the back and just let them sit there. And no. I've never had a fish hop out. I'm not saying it's not possible. <laughs> yeah. Well, you can also use a stringer. Um, the thing with using a stringer as you're moving around that creates drag. So you could put them on a stringer and when you're moving, then throw them in the back. That, that would probably be your best bet. Yeah. Yes, it will. Minnow bucket will pull drag. That's why I use a cooler. Cool. Cool. Anybody else? Yes, sir. That's a really good question. That's a fun question. So he asked, if you're kayak fishing for flatheads, do you find it better to drop a bait straight down over the structure, or is it better to set up above the structure and cast to it? Well, it depends on the structure, but as a general rule, I will set up above and cast to it first, and I'll give it five or ten minutes. No more, because either he's going to swim out and eat your bait and turn around, or he's not that active or not that hungry, or he don't know your bait's there. My next step, if it's a prime spot, I'll do the next step. If it's just, if I'm just hitting a marginal spot as I move down river, then I skip this one. If it's a big brush pile, big prime real estate, flathead type cover, I'm gonna move right next to the structure. And you gotta be careful. You don't wanna set up in the structure where the main current is hitting it, because if you fall out, they call them strainers for a reason. And they can be really dangerous. So if I'm moving within the structure, within the brush, I'm doing it in a spot of reduced current just for safety reasons. And then that's where a nine and a half foot rod comes to handy out of a kayak. Because a seven and a half footer, you got seven and a half foot of reach to drop it down in whatever nook and cranny you see. So I'll have a seven and a half and a nine and a half. So if I want to reach out and drop it a long ways away, I can and still have that direct line of contact which reduces snags. So I, when I'm kayak fishing for flatheads, I usually have a seven and a half and a nine and a half foot rod with me for that reason. So, cool. Any others? Yes, sir. For bank fishing or kayak fishing or? Both, for, for bank fishing, I generally use a standard Carolina rig, just like this one, and you can, soup it up however you want, I guess. But you just got a weight, a bead, a swivel, leader. You can put a rattle on. I usually run one with a rattle, one without. Sometimes it seems to make a really big difference. Sometimes it doesn't seem to make any difference at all. And then you put a bead. It'll actually protect your rattle if you run one. Then you're hooked. So that's my standard bank rig. I got a sliding sinker. Just pretty normal stuff. When I'm fishing from a kayak, I got two different rigs. So. If I'm fishing daytime flatheads, this, I don't know, 12, 14 inch leader goes down to about four to six. Really, really short leader. This sliding sinker is gone. I got a clip on my swivel, or I do a three-way crane swivel with a clip on the bottom, and I'll clip my bank sinker. That way everything's real compact. So when you're dropping in in those brush piles, you can move it around with getting fewer snags. And there's two modes of thought on your hook. So I've never been a big, big circle hook fan for flatheads. I'm going to experiment with them more this year uh, because of the, how much more snag resistant they are. Because the hook point goes back to your, your, the shaft of your hook, they're, they're not going to get stuck in uh, the, a stump or anything like that nearly as easy. If it's a small twig, they might get caught on it, but you can break those lots of times. A J hook, it sets into whatever it comes in contact with. But the reason I like to use J hooks for daytime flatheads is because they'll eat it and just sit there lots of times. And that's not an indicator of how big the fish is. Just because a fish slams a rod doesn't mean it's big. And just because a, a fish eats it and just sits there doesn't mean it's small either. So I like having the option with the eight to 10 knot J hook. When he swallows it and your whole rod goes thump, you know, 
and then he, he moves off about six inches and your rod sits there like this for about 30 seconds. And if you have a circle hook, you're like, what the hell do I do now? So with the J hook, you get to reel down, reel down, reel down, bury it, then, then smoke him and land more fish. Or at least have the opportunity to stick more fish than you would have otherwise. Once you hook them, then it's up to you. That's a lot of fun. Great question. Appreciate it, man. Anybody else? All right. I really appreciate your time, and thanks for coming to watch me. It was a lot of fun, so appreciate it. And if anybody else has a question that pops up, I'll be at the, the Whisker Seeker booth or just wandering around. If you see me, definitely stop by and say hi. It's a lot of fun.